Heather to go ahead and just mention. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear us at the back? It's okay? Good. Louder? Okay. Uh, we're going to start off as usual and have uh, Paul do the pledge for us. And the first thing I want to remind you of is any of you that served in the military, you don't have to remove your hat. Oh, you don't? And you can salute during the pledge. Please do it if, if you feel free to do it. Please do it. Okay. I pledge to make this. Incidentally, that um, flyer that Neil Durham is bringing around to you doesn't have the address at the Skyview High School. That's at Greenhurst and Powerline. Yeah, here, in, here in Lampa. Thank you, Bo. On Veterans Day at 11 o'clock in Kleiner Park, at the, War Mem at the Rock of Honor, there will be memorial services, so you're all welcome. At 10 Kleiner Park at the Rock of Honor, with the, their 61 names of Meridian veterans who never came home. If you haven't seen that, you've got to get over and see the Rock of Honor. Thank you. 11, 11, at 11 o'clock. Okay. Just off Eagle at Kleiner Park on Records Road, just instead of turning into Walmart, you make a left turn if you're coming off Eagle Road. Okay, thank you. So we want to thank our sponsors today. We have Treasure Valley Coffee that has donated all the coffee again, and also uh, Cloverdale Funeral Home, which has sponsored all of our goodies and treats today. And then we want to say thank you to all of our volunteers who come out early every morning and set up for us. Uh, some of our announcements, you probably know that our Veterans Breakfast is going to be this coming Sunday. We hope you're planning on coming. It's from 8 a.m. to noon, and it's $3 for uh, military and seniors and kids, and it's $5 general admission, and you get pancakes and sausage and eggs and coffee and juice and hash browns. It's a really great breakfast, so we hope that you'll come out to that. What time? 8 a.m. to noon. Okay this Sunday. And tomorrow morning early, David is going to be here. Tomorrow morning early, 4.30, please join me. <laughs> if you give me your phone number, I'll be happy to call and remind you. No, I know. Tomorrow morning, uh, Larry Gephardt will be here for the weather. <laughs> and we'll be set up over here with making some imitation pancakes and whatnot to advertise our breakfast on Sunday that Heather just told you about. What so, are, what are, uh, intermittent, what did you say early? Early tomorrow morning, Larry Gephardt. Yeah, we're gonna be making some pancakes and hash browns and eggs, and um, I don't know how good they taste, but they look okay on the television. <laughs> and if you'd like to come and help us make that, Larry and I will be here with Larry Gephardt and his people, Heather. Gorgeous Heather will be here tomorrow morning at 4.30. And so we're going to be holding up. So, hey, everybody give her a hand. So, um, look, look us up tomorrow morning. Uh, you'll be seeing us uh, blurry-eyed in the morning. But uh, please, as Heather said, please invite yourself and your neighbors and everyone to come to the breakfast on Sunday morning until noon. Where? Here. <laughs> Here, and I'm the parking guru again, I'm parking. Uh, you know, we've had, what, 12? How many people have we had, 12? 
hundred people or more. And I tell you, uh, parking is going to be an issue. So please, if you can help me to do that as well. But no, we'll be parking them all here in the lot on Sunday. Thank you very much. Um, Lance uh, wanted us to let you know he has the uh, books uh, from the last honor flight. So if you went on that flight, uh, see Lance after, and he will have the books to uh, pass out. Are you going to be out here or in the classroom? Let's do it right here. In front. We'll do it right out here. So after today's presentation, if you were on the last honor flight, come up here and he'll have your memory book for you. <coughs> and now, uh, if we have any new people, any visitors for the first time, we'd like you to identify yourselves and uh, Heather will come and uh, visit. Just put your hand up. Uh, my name is Matt Conrad. Uh, just got off active duty in August, uh, five years with the Marine Corps. Um, I was stationed in Washington, D.C. for most of five years. So I probably saw a handful of the honor flight guys uh, when they were out there. And uh, I'm really excited to be here, uh, going to school with uh, Bill Julio out at uh, Sopop Aviation. Learn to be a pilot so I can take, you know, take some jobs out there and uh, looking forward to it. Thanks for having us. Sands. I was uh, in Vietnam in 68-69, got out of uh, the Army, went to college, came in the Air Force for 30 years, and uh, mostly uh, fighter jets. Anyone else? Hi, I'm Quaker Sebesky, brand new in the area. And I was in the Army, went to Vietnam two years, six months of air traffic control. And I'm glad to be here with the group. So. I'm Doug Cleveland. I've been around here before. I lived in Nampa all my life. <coughs> Not because I've been out here in the district, though. I was in during the Korean conflict for eight years in the uh, 160 Harvard, 1st Calvary. I uh, spent a lot of time on those little travel, travel tracks. Sherman M2 tank. Never set foot in Korea. But you could get killed over here in one of <laughs> Hi, my name's Jamie. I just moved here from Missoula, Montana. Lance is my uncle, so that's why I'm here, and I'm glad to be here with all of you guys. And I'm hoping to go back to school, and that's also why I'm here. Great. Thank you. Is there one over here? <laughs> Two daughters that went with me. 
He's going to talk about a book which uh, we wrote together with a group of us, and it's all about the Veterans History Project. Thank you. I've talked to you before, but I'm trying to make another pitch. If you haven't heard us, everybody probably familiar with the Veterans History Project. If not, we can sure tell you. But uh, the museum here has done over 900 interviews of veterans. And for a fundraising project, uh, about two years ago, we started on putting the book together. We have 61 of the veteran stories in here. Uh, and uh, we're selling this for a, all the proceeds go to help the Veterans History Project. And I'd like to introduce Ben Collins. Ben, where are you at? If you'd stand up there. He's one of the people in the book, and I'm sure he would be glad to sign his uh, particular thing there if you wanted to do that. Anyway, we, we've got a little booth set up there. Please come by. If you haven't already bought one, I know we sold a lot the last one there, but uh, $15 uh, and it all goes to, to the fund. I don't know. Do we have any other people that are in the book here? Yeah. Jury Law. Anyway, the several, so a couple of them in there. So anyway, it's a good project. It's all. Uh, it's a good read. Everybody that's read has been happy. Please come and buy a book and help support the Veterans History Project. Thank you. And now uh, we have a guest speaker today. His name is Alan Bond. Uh, he's an Air Force veteran. Uh, flew for Horizon Air for many years and currently is an uh, IT manager at Boise State University. He's uh, going to talk about his observations and interactions with the German people uh, during the 70th uh, anniversary events. Uh, Alan was overwhelmed by the hearty response of the German people uh, of old East Germany regarding the American World War II soldiers and the love and respect uh, that they garnered. Uh, and uh, he also participated in the Liberty Convoy and seeing German reenactors honoring uh, uh, the sacrifices of the U.S. Army in liberating them from uh, tyranny. It was quite an amazing trip. So, a uh, big welcome to Alan, please. Okay, we're good now. So, here we are. Thank you for all coming. It, uh, I'm impressed. Louder? Okay. You, <laughs> the uh, here April 9th to the 17th. So that's when Buchenwald uh, concentration camp was liberated on April 12th. So I'll give you the background here in a minute, but whoa, whoa, I can't see now. <laughs> I won't be able to read my notes. <laughs> so I'll have to go by heart. Um, the, uh, there. <clears throat> 
That's my dad on the left and my uncle Ira on the right. My dad was uh, drafted in October of 1941, before the war started. He was born in, uh, on August 10th, 1916, so he was 25 when he was drafted. And uh, he was not happy about that, I don't think. <laughs> and 26 was the draft age, max draft age, so they just got him. After boot camp, he went to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, and through the combat engineer training. After combat engineer training, they assigned him to the 35th Engineer Combat Regiment that was currently in Fort Ord. In March, they left Fort Ord and participated in the invasion of Canada. So that, that was, there were air quotes around that. They, uh, they helped build the Alcan Highway from just northwest of Edmonton, the Fort Nelson, Dawson Creek area, all the way up to Whitehorse, where another unit that came from Anchorage did you know, help build the other part. And why did they build the Alcan? People ask me that all the time. It's because the Lend-Lease uh, of aircraft to Russia, the P-39 Air Cobras, needed refueling stops. And instead of going to Seattle and then the coast, they wanted a more direct route. So that's why they built the Alcan. It wasn't to connect anything. It was to have a way to get troops and get the fueling stops and airfields on the way. So at that time, they were a regiment. They spent from uh, March of 42 to about October of 43 on the Alcan, and then they came back to the US, went to Klamath Falls at Camp White, and then as part of the war effort, they spent several months <laughs> harvesting potatoes for farmers because uh, there were nobody else around to, to do that. I'm sure there was no barracks chatter there about uh, what a way to run a war, but, you know, because we all know how much people like to sit around and do nothing. <laughs> so, or do something that they weren't trained for. The, after few months they finally were transferred by railroad over to Camp Kilmer in New York and from there they went to England and in about the end of July they landed in England worked their way to Southampton where they crossed over and landed at Normandy on Omaha Beach on August 9th. So a little bit after all that, all the, the real action. And initially they were assigned to go up to Cherbourg, but right as they started heading there, these Germans surrendered in Cherbourg. They turned them over to Brest on the northwest, the northwest port there in France. They fought in the Battle of Brest for a few months. In October, after the surrender of the Germans there, they ended up moving over to uh, Luxembourg. And they were in Luxembourg at the time of the, the bulge. So his unit was pulled out, sent up to Bastogne. He was not a part of that. He, he and another guy were left back to hold, the, hold down the fort, which also got overrun. And so the 35th <laughs> Engineer Combat Battalion was, had several companies assigned to the 101st there in Bastogne. They left one company there and they were relieved by Patton. After that, they were assigned to the 3rd Army. He participated in the, the assault crossings at 
of the Moselle or Mosel River in Germany, right near Koblenz, and then they did the assault crossing at, uh, of the Rhine right there by Koblenz. The um, interesting thing later you'll see is the uh, 87th Infantry, they, they were taking the, one of their regiments across in the Moselle and the, the Rhine. So that's a foreshadowing there because in a little bit later we'll be talking about the same unit. Uh, then they, in April they ended up in the Weimar area of Germany. It's right on the north, oh, well it's in the, there's a corner, I can show you on the map easier and I can explain it. So. Let's get to a map here. Wrong one. Oh, now it's not showing up there. This is Frankfurt here. This is Weimar here. There's the northwest corner of what's now the Czech Republic. It was Czechoslovakia then. His unit ended up right in this area here. And at the time, they were still with the Third Army, George S. Patton's army. And they were repairing bridges that mostly the bridges that the German army blew up as they were leaving the area. And so in May when the war ended, they were still there. They stayed there till July and uh, took repairing buildings, cleaning streets because they were bombed so much, helping out all the people getting, you know, things back to, back to order. In July, they, because of the Yalta conference, they were told to leave, and the Russians came in. So the, uh, that's, that's part of my story here, why I ended up in Germany, especially in that Weimar area. My dad was an avid writer in his journal from 41 to 45. I, after he died, he died in uh, 91, I transcribed all his journals. I, he took photographs the whole time. He was, uh, on the Alcan, people bought all his photos, found out later that they were, you know, people would find photos of the building the highway and they give them to Milepost Magazine, if anybody's familiar with Milepost Magazine for the Alcan Highway. And I came across one of them one time and said, well, that's one of Dad's pictures there. And he finally got credit for those while he was still alive. But then I got all his photos and started cataloging them and scanning them. And then one of those providential things, there was a young lieutenant, first lieutenant, and the 101st Airborne. This was about the end of the 90s, right around 99, 2000, whose grandfather had just died, and he was given, his father didn't want all of his grandfather's stuff, and there were all these photos in there. His grandfather was in the 35th Engineer Combat Battalion. And he found this one photo of this man, this soldier, campaign hat on up in the Alcan, and it had my dad's name written on the back of it. So 
this is, you know, nowadays finding somebody is almost too easy. Yeah, but he went through phone books and everything and finally tracked down my mom. My mom referred him to me. I said, well, yeah, that's a picture of my dad and showed all that. Well, he, since he was in the 101st and his grandfather was in the unit that helped the 101st at Bastogne, he got really interested. Well, Sean is now a lieutenant colonel he was the ROTC commander at University of Kentucky until May of this year. Now he's commanding a regiment at the 101st again at Fort Campbell. He has gone even farther than I have, set up websites, got all that. Well, I gave him all the photos that I'd scanned and people started finding his website and then he'd refer them to me. So, the Alcan, if you saw the American experience on Alcan, they got a bunch of photos there, nine photos that they did on an American experience. Um, some other authors have contacted me. But the reason in, in this story, the important one, is this author named Flint Whitlock out of Denver has written, a, was writing a trilogy about Buchenwald. His first one was The Beast of Buchenwald. And he asked if he could use some of Dad's photos in there. So there's about seven or eight photos in that one. He's written two, the two following volumes also. Well, August or July of, the end of July of last year, 2014, my wife and I decided to take a cruise and do the Danube from Bucharest or Budapest to to Nuremberg, Germany, and she generously agreed to when we got to Nuremberg to take another week and rent a car and drive up to so I could see some of the places Dad had taken photos of, and I you know I say generously. Sometimes wives like doing, going out and looking at bridges <laughs> that were <laughs> damaged 70 years ago. And, you know, but, so there we are wandering around the country, out in the middle of nowhere, finding these places. So she, she was a trooper and made it, made it through. But before I left, I contacted, contacted Flint who wrote this book and said, do you have any contacts in Weimar at, out at Buchenwald that I could talk to when I get there? Maybe, you know, get a on-site tour or whatever. Well, he gave me the, the name of one of the guys that helped him. He was a volunteer archivist at, at Buchenwald. And when we got to Weimar, we met him. And I showed him all the photos that I had of Buchenwald and everything, because my dad had gone there while they were, it had already been liberated, but he'd gone there and taken photos and, and all that. And so, Baird Schmidt got me an invite to the April celebrations. So that's the roundabout story of how I ended up in Germany. And then things really started happening. Um, Baron, uh, I, we had a photo, my dad took a photo of a bunch of kids in front of a house, German kids, in front of a house in Pausa, Germany, which is right about, if I can find that. It's right in here. That's where their company was billeted right in the village. And so I asked Baron, well, gosh, it'd be, really be nice if when I come over, if I could, you know, see if any of these kids are around, if they're still living or whatever. So Baron contacted this gentleman in Pausa who restores U.S. Army World War II vehicles and has several and he formed 
this liberty convoy where they reenact um, U.S. Army, they you know little actions that they and celebrate the U.S. Army in Germany. So you have to understand that this part from right about where are we here? From right about here and up was all East Germany. That was the part that the Russians took over and was uh, part of the Soviet bloc for 45 years. So these people were communists, our enemies. You know, when I was in, uh, they were they were the guys. You know, we were were, were worried about, and and so all all these people in the Liberty Convoy are actual they're Germans. Most of them were in the East German Army, and they're reenacting what the Americans did during World War II. The uh, Andreas Breuer, you know, it's got an umlaw and all that other stuff, but he is the, he calls himself Sergeant Bull. He contacted the newspaper in Pausa. They put a bunch of the pictures, the photo of the kids, and said, anybody, can anybody find these kids? Anybody know them? Well, they found out of the, let's see, there's six of them. They found five of them were still alive. Three of them still lived in Pausa. One of them um, was married and lived somewhere else in Germany. And they could not find one. They thought she might have been um, a refugee and nobody, nobody knew her contact. So Andreas worked out that a day to meet them. So I headed off, went, flew Boise, Chicago, Frankfurt, trained to Weimar, and then the most amazing thing, you know, I was not expecting much, because when my wife and I were back there driving around, it's different than, Old East Germany is a little different, you know, Hungary's different, Slovakia is different than the West. Even though it's been 25 years since the wall came down, there's just this different feel. They, they have the old history, but it's like there's this big blank. And the, the architecture and all that is just blank and blah and gray. And so I was not expecting much when I, when I got there. I'd gotten all these invitations to attend. Then, and Baird was saying, well, Helen Patton, the granddaughter of, of George S. Patton was gonna be there and I'm going, okay, that's neat. So we got, my expectations were not very high. Let me get back to the slides here. If I can get it. Yeah. So the first day, this was April 10th, it was Friday, they had a this get together in the Rathaus, which is a city hall. I always thought that was interesting, rat house, politicians, but that's, that's a political comment. comment but. So they started out, and I didn't know any of this, this part of the history, but evidently in, on April 10th of 1945, one of the regiments of the 87th Infant 80th Infantry 
of the Third Army was surrounding Weimar. And Colonel Costello, the commander of that, that regiment, negotiated a peaceful surrender of Weimar. So at the 65th anniversary, they dedicated this plaque here, and of course. Too touchy. Cannot get it back to that one. <laughs> So they dedicated that plaque. The, the mayor gave a speech outside, the mayor gave a speech inside, everybody was talking, you know, it's all in German. And then after it was done, this is Helen Patton here. That's Helen there, there too, but. And they gave, they gave all these speeches and everything and shaking hands and people going around. This guy here in the center, he's a RCAF um, the, let's see, he was a pilot on the Lancaster, was shot down in that area and held at Buchenwald. That's a Luftwaffe, current Luftwaffe officer there that was escorting him around. And he was telling stories to Helen about what happened. This looks like one of those just horrible things to do, you know, texting while you're, you know, doing all that. Well, they moved to the new city hall and everybody gave some speeches. The mayor talked again. And this gentleman right here is the grandson of Colonel Costello here in the photo, the portrait. So the reason I have that in there is this is another serendipitous moment. When he gave, he was donating, his family was donating Colonel Costello's portrait to the city so they could hang it up. There's the man that negotiated the sur peaceful surrender. Well, the story he told about this portrait was that he, um, a prisoner at Buchenwald was a Czech painter. And when the officers found, the, found out that he was a portraitist, they all got their portraits painted. And this is the portrait. When Helen got up to talk, she said, this is unbelievable. I have been searching all over for this artist because, you know, in the movie Patton, where he's sitting, sitting there for a portrait, well, this was the artist that was doing that portrait at the same time, same period, because all the officers in the Third Army were getting their portraits painted by this guy, prisoner out of Buchenwald. She had not known who, where this guy was, how, it, how he painted it. So right there she's texting her assistant at the Patton, Patton Foundation saying, we found him, you know. So even though everybody, you know, all these people know everything about stuff, there's sometimes things just come together and they find out more information. So after <coughs> going through all these speeches and everybody talking, they had a lot of, a lot of survivors. The interesting thing is that the German, the Nazis said that no American or no Allied prisoners were ever kept at Buchenwald. Well, you saw one back there, the RCAF guy. Well, there were about four or five others at this, you know, at, at this event that were all either B-17 bombers or gunners or whatever. 
they were in there, even though they still denied that any Allied prisoners were held at Buchenwald. Because Buchenwald initially was just a, a German, you know, Nazi camp for, you know, people they didn't like, political prisoners and everything. So there was actual, you know, evidence that that was not true. Well, the next thing happened, Andreas Sergeant Bull had contacted the city of Plauen, which was just south of Pausa, and said, well, my dad had taken a lot of photos of the damaged city. Well, they said, well, send them to us. So I sent them all the photos I had of the city, and I, they said, we want to put it up in the archives. So can you come down the evening of April 10th and, you know, we're, we're going to do the grand opening and it'd be great if you could be there. So I showed up, not, ex you know, I, okay, so they're going to have some photos in their archive. Well, come to find out, my dad's photos were, they had some other photos there that were taken by professional photographers. But my dad's photos ended up being the centerpiece of the whole thing. I was just blown away. I couldn't believe it. And they started the, um, this was the entrance of it. That's my dad sitting there with a little, wow, this is, <laughs> sensitive with a fawn on his lap. Over, and they had it translated in German and in, in English. And they took his journal for that whole period and all along here, they have his, his journal in both German and English. All of these are his photos here on this whole wall. They had this whole thing and I was not ready for it, but I was the center of attention. And, you know, I'm going, well, no, these are my dad's photos. He, you know, I, I didn't, I just sent them to you. And they had this whole reception and, and the mayor, the mayor there talked a little bit, but I'd just been through the whole day where Helen Patton was, you know, everybody went up to Helen and said hi and, you know, and she was the center of attention. Then all of a sudden, I'm thrown into the center. And, you know, they, they took... The next day, it was in the paper. I was... Just in one day, I, my, any expectations I had were just exceeded. And the interesting thing, the, the archivist there spoke very little English. They had a translator that would help me. But when they, they had this celebration at their uh, old church right after that, I found out I was the center of attention there. They got introduced by the mayor again. And, and when we were walking over to the church, she, in broken English, said, your father was a good man. I said, yes. And she said she knew because the way he was holding, she called it a baby, you know, the little fawn there. And I found out that the reason they wanted to show his pictures over all these other ones was it wasn't, his weren't political. His weren't professional. They were from a real person, you know, who saw the real thing and that's why they focused on it. And the whole event was, and people talked about it in the event, from the, what I got from the interpreter, that the war was stupid, bad, horrible. Why would we have ever done that? Let's not do it again. So this was to remind the young people this is what happens when people get stupid. So that was 
one day and I was just overwhelmed. The next day, the uh, Andreas and his group, the Liberty Convoy, had set up a commemoration, another Liberty Convoy commemoration around the Buchenwald area. So this, they went, they had a couple big trucks and Jeeps and motorcycles. They even had a, one of those weasels, the track laying utility vehicle, but it threw a track and so they, it went out on a tow truck. Um, all these vehicles and all these guys dressed in uniform. The first place we stopped was this place. This memorial, it's all in German. I translated it somewhere. I think it's on my website. Is for five American flyers from a B-17 that were shot down in the area. They all parachuted. They were all killed by the SS. So that memorial is right, right there. I can't remember the name. It's a little little village. And this Liberty Convoy was going around to all these memorials for the U.S. You know. U.S. soldiers and laying wreaths. So here's one of the vehicles. Here's the guys, they're all in period uniforms. They've done this all at their own cost. They have all the weapons. Andreas has that big deuce and a half with the little turret on top for a 50 cal and he says he has the 50 cal he's got all the ammunition but in Germany he's not allowed to have it out on the road they've got M1s they've got the Garands the carbines they're not allowed to use those out when they go out on their thing and if you I don't have I just to explain I, I printed out some little cards that have my name and my email it's got my website on there so anybody wants it you can get that and a little bit of information on the 35th engineers but there's also some YouTube video from Pilsen, Pilsen Czech Republic from this year where this Liberty Convoy and all the people from Czech the Czech Republic that are doing the same thing met in Pilsen for the liberation celebration of the liberation of Pilsen. They had blank ammo, but they had all the guns. They reenacted the taking of the city hall with the German snipers up on the church tower, the whole thing, firing, doing all that. They aren't allowed to do that in Germany. They can do it in the Czech Republic. So they had a little ceremony and event here at that this location. Here's Andreas, Sergeant Bull, Helen Patton, right there. And this is Baird Schmidt, my friend from Weimar who organized pretty much everything there. This, you might recognize him from the previous picture, Colonel Costello, that's his grandson that gave the, foot, the portrait. I can't remember his last name. It's like Bill Zimmer or something. It's not um, Costello, so. So they're talking there. Here she is delivering the Patent Foundation reenactors code. Well, they have the, uh, it's translated out of German into English and not very well, but they have their own code for the Liberty Convoy. And their motto is remember, admonish, reconcile. And they're there to commemorate the things that the Allies did for them, did for Germany and liberating them. Because these people have been through a lot in the East, Old East Germany. They, you know, they didn't have things good like the West Germans did when the Allies stayed there and are still there.
So then the, the real treat, you know, my dad was, I think his uh, 214 said, toolkeeper. He was a T5 technician, fifth grade. When I was young, I thought, well, fifth, that's higher than one, you know, because E1, O1, you know, goes that way. Well, come to find out that a T5 is the lowest technician grade. So I was, blew that bubble about your dad, you know, but he was a, he had a trailer with all the tools and he was a tool keeper for the, for company C. And he always had to find some truck to hook up his trailer. And then he sat in this right seat going down. So I got to do where he traveled from all over Europe in the same seat. And we're taking over, taking a German town here. So that, that was another highlight of my my trip. Um, there's the, we had to stop because they had permits and the permits only allowed them to be in certain places at certain time, you know, because the Germans are very, very, they liked order and you have to do things right. So we had to sit there and wait until it was time to go to the next little little village. This next village, they put a wreath on the first place that the Third Army encountered prisoners from Buchenwald. It was called the, and they had this little um, memorial there. If you don't don't have to worry about reading all that. If you have, if you can get on my website, I've got all these photos, and you can get them to where they're readable. But right before the Russians were pinching, coming in from the east, the Allies were coming in from the west. The Germans said, "Well, we've got to get all these prisoners out of Buchenwald, and they need to go." south and west. So they started what's called the Todes March, which is the death march. So they were sending these prisoners just walking, no food, poor clothing, just walking. And you can see the, the red lines where they went. Well, at this point was the first contact that the, U, the US Army, the Third Army, had with these prisoners. They put up a little thing there. That night, we they had this celebration. They had a a jazz band, a 40s style jazz band, there playing all this American jazz music. It was at this little restaurant. So this was another one of those surprise moments. I was really tired. We sat down, had some great, great food. But then they, all of a sudden, they started bringing, and they brought in all these kids from five to teenager. And they sat them around in this little hall around the front. And then old people got up and started talking, of course, in German. And I wasn't near anybody that could translate. And Helen Patton was sitting a little bit farther over. She speaks great German and a little bit of French and a little bit of this and that. And, but I wasn't near her so she could translate for me. And it just droned on and on and on. I'd recognize a word here or there. And when we were done, found out from her that she just said, this was the most moving night I've experienced so far. These older people, it's the first time they've had an audience. They've been repressed for so long, they could not tell their children or anyone if they got caught telling them what happened when the Americans left it was severe consequences, prison, whatever. 
The Russians changed all the textbooks to show that the Russians liberated them. The Americans had nothing to do with it. You know, I mean, they redacted stuff right in their textbooks because Baird was going, th he was a kid during that time. He didn't, he never knew what really happened until he got older and they were liberated from the Soviet bloc. The, you know, so all these old people were up there telling them the real story. They'd never, even 25 years after being, you know, the, the block falling and the wall coming down, they never were able to tell the true story of what happened, you know, when the Russians came in. So I was really sorry that I had, didn't know that was what was going on what they were talking about. But they were telling the young people in that village, you know, what the true story was. And here in the restaurant, on the wall is all this stuff about Patton and the Third Army and what they did. The next day was the celebration, the day, the April 12th was the day that the U.S. liberated Buchenwald. This was the entrance here. This is, was our trip in, in August of last year. Took the entrance. This is a photo my dad took on June 24th, 45. Nothing else is, the, the crematorium is still there. They've torn down all the barracks. He had a lot of pictures of different barracks and He'd also, in 45, when he was there, this gentleman had been a prisoner since like 38. He was from Chicago. Since he was an American, they threw him into Buchenwald. This table was where they took the bodies after they died. Buchenwald was not a death camp, but they had a crematorium there because People were dying like flies because they, even though it wasn't a death camp, they didn't have the gas chambers and, and all that. They, they just died of starvation or, you know, natural causes. So I think he says here, this is where the SS doctors would remove the gold from the teeth and any other valuables before they headed off. This was right off the crematorium. So that table is still there. The only thing missing is that big thing there and they've added a, a little display case where they have some of the instruments that they found there. So that's 70 years after and they still have that part. And in the crematorium, it's exactly the same. So that afternoon we all went out and they had this nice celebration. A lot of survivors, families of survivors, a lot of speeches. All these are German children with the different flags of, of uh, all the countries involved. And I was not a survivor and not a liberator, so I didn't get to go in the, the circle there, but I was out standing with Flint Whitlock, the author of the book. We were listening, and this one gentleman was talking in German, and all of a sudden, the people around us started booing and hissing and just making a big scene. So when we were leaving, I asked Baird, you know, Flint understood a lot of German, but he didn't understand what, what this guy was saying to make him mad. Well, we asked Baird what was going on, and he's just disgusted and says, well, it's the, uh, 
the communist. It's hard to see here, but this prison initially was where they put all the German Communist Party. They were identified by a red triangle on their, their suits. The Jews had the, the star, the gold star. The communists had the red triangle. Well, throughout here, you would see the, they had flags with prison, the, you know, the striped prison flag and a red triangle in there. We were standing right around a bunch of them that had scarves on like that and all that. Well, Baron said when this gentleman was saying no, and he said it several times, the Americans liberated Buchenwald. And he said it over and over and over again. He was there, he saw it happen. The Americans liberated Buchenwald. Well, that's when all the communists around me were hissing and booing because they've been trying to tell people that no, the communists inside the prison were the ones that disarmed all the SS and fought their way out and the Americans showed up at the same time. And it's kind of like, well, did Hitler cause the Holocaust or was it Goebbels or Goebbels or, you know, who, who was it that caused the I mean, if the Americans hadn't been coming, the SS mo wouldn't have left in droves and, you know, so it's one of those little nitpicking things, but all throughout the audience here, there were red triangle flags with D-Linka, D-I-E-L-I-N-K-E, -E, which means the left. And Baron says that, I, I think they've got like 5% of, five. I'm not sure the exact number, but in the government, the German government, they, they are an active part there. They're all young people, you know, who would guess? Um, and a lot of them are from the West because the East Germans already knew they lived through what Delinka means. And they're, I was just so impressed with Andreas and Bern. Andreas was an East German. He said, he, he, he made it past PFC, but when he told him that communist sucks, they put him back there. So he was thrown in jail when he was a teenager because he, involved, he got involved in the, the resurrection, trying to throw out, overthrow communism. These guys, you know, they've, they got the indoctrination, they fought it, now they're fighting it even more. And it, it was heartening to me because I'm glad somebody's fighting this. You know, I just, it was, these, these guys are really serious. They want knowledge out there. They think knowledge is the way to fight this because people forget. They don't want it to happen again. Well, the next day, Andreas picked me up in Weimar and he started driving me to all these places because I'd sent him the photos and he'd been researching and he drove me around to all these places where he thought photos would be. And I got, this is, these are none. I could have you bored to tears here. I may have you already, but um, he, he took me to all these places that my dad had taken photos, not all of them, because he took a lot of photos too. But here's one of them. This was the house, the south side, of, or the east side of the street here in Pauza, the US Army came in, the 35th. This was Company C Street. The east side, they just 
moved the Germans out and they all went with family and, and or across the street or whatever. This was the house that he was billeted in. That was the room. So this is May 11th of 45. This is just in April. Who knows how long the house was there before, but Three, this was one photo where the, these, there were one, two, th three, four girls and one boy. Well, this one here is her. This one here is her. And of course, the ugly one is me. <laughs> This thing just, there we go. The, uh, she was, this woman was 10, Ursula was 10 when she had this photo taken right here. She was eight. So she's 80 now and Margo is 78. So they had this little reception. The next person, this, the boy in there, he wasn't able to make it. He lives, still lives in Bowza, but uh, he, he wasn't feeling good that day. Or so the other gentleman over there and his wife, his, my dad took this photo in June, 45. That's him here on the shoulders. So I had Andreas try to play, but they wouldn't do the whole thing, so. <laughs> Carl is a, just a kick. He's been going through, he's 75, he was 75 there. Been going through chemo and radiation for cancer, but nothing was gonna stop him from getting up here. He comes rolling in in his Audi TT with his wife and sweet lady, just wonderful lady, and just happy. It was unbelievable. And then I found out in June, Andrea sent me an email and said that Carl didn't make it. He, he died. But this was his, his last little for a, and he was, he was gonna do it. Then we went out, there were a lot of other things that happened, but this bridge here, Elsterbrucke, was built in 11th or 12th century. The 87th Infantry, the same infantry that my dad's unit had done the assault crossing, on the Rhine and the Moselle was taking the town of Plauen and they noticed German, the Germans putting charges, detonation charges on the bridge and they were gonna blow it to keep them from going across. So they attacked, they sent a force in. Am I getting close to time? Okay, almost done here. They uh, sent a force in, captured the bridge, de you know, deactivated all the explosives, the bridge still stands. So they had a big celebration there, U.S. Consul. There weren't as many vets there this year, the 65th when they had a lot of vets. I was the only one, <laughs> other than the, the Liberty Convoy people that were there, Andreas over there. And uh, so they had the nice music and everything. And, and I can read this because you, if you're like me, you can't from back there. On April 16th, 1945, the 87th Infantry Division of 3rd U.S. Army arrived in the town on this day. The, the, yeah, this is, they should have had me help them translate, but 
On this day, the World War II and the catastrophic destruction ended for Plowen. Historical Elster Bridge shall be a symbol for intercultural understanding and peace. So they had another celebration. <laughs> and then this, this was my last day in Germany and we met in the Knights of Germany, old, you know, 10th century meeting hall in these, and I get in there and there's a picture of my dad being projected up there. Yeah, you know, the whole trip, I just wish he could have been there to see, you know, he, he was a nobody. He was a lot to me, but he, he was nobody. But these people, you know, the, the ladies in, the, in the, uh, that photo were talking. They said, you know, when, when before the Americans came, it was bad. You know, the Germans, the, things were bad. And when the Germans were moving through, they'd just move into the houses with the people, eat their food, do, you know, it was their duty, it was, you know, the Vaterland, and they, that was their duty to house them and feed them and all that. The Germans told them that the Americans were evil, devils, they were gonna rape all the women and kill all the children, and. And the Americans came in, they just said, well, we need somewhere to stay. You people move over here. They said they never, no American ever entered any of their houses, ever. They had them do their laundry and paid them. What they really wanted was the soap. The kids were in everything and never got in trouble with the GIs. You know, you can see the, and they were just astonished. The Russians came in, they went through everybody's houses. They were looking for swastikas. If there was a swastika found in a book, in anything, the family was immediately arrested and taken off, either killed or whatever happened, I don't know. They took all photos, they took everything, stripped the house of any memories. These ladies had one picture, it would, was in that same time period, that's it, somebody had hidden. Their whole memories were taken away. And they said, so the, the Germans were there, it was bad, but they lived through it. Americans came, things were good and getting better. Russians came and it was done. They've, and they're still recovering from it after 25 years of freedom. So that was, that was my, my trip. It was just very eye-opening. I never expected all that. I thought I was going to be a pariah there. You know, well, there's the guys. He was part, his father was part of the blowing everything up and, you know, they caused all this problem, but I didn't get that at all. And they, they were just, and, and then to have, I wish my dad was here so he could have seen that his photos were there. He would have been so proud to see his picture up there on the, uh, you know, all these people looking at it. So I think my time's up, right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Alan, very much. Uh, Alan has a lot of stuff up here to look at, and he'll be here to talk, so please come and uh, have a look. Well, yeah, on our flight, uh, folks, uh, don't forget your, your books will be over here with Lance. Up here. Up here with Lance. Thank you. I think he said it